Hello everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to the Media Monsters TV. Um, pretty much uh, as, as you know, I cover a variety of, um, a variety of events. I do the, uh, the in-studio TV, um, as well as I film fashion shows, uh, events, special events. Um, I do a lot of different things. Also, I do press coverage. Um, as well um, in the community and abroad so I'd like to thank everyone for continuing to support um, the Media Monster movement um, but today um, we have a return guest um, this is a gentleman that's been on my show previously um, I'm going to introduce him to you uh, right now I want to introduce to you uh, Mr. Pete Shirell Thank you for coming on my show sir. again. My pleasure. All right, my brother. Pleasure. All right. So the last time you were on uh, my show, uh, you were running as a candidate for Mount Vernon mayor. Um, yes. That was a year ago. Um, how was that experience for you? And we're going to talk about how that experience led to your new book. Yes. That's what politicians do. I guess I'm a real politician now. Yes. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so and last time we was on your show, we, uh, you was uh, allowed me to come on your show so I could discuss my campaign um, endeavors and ambitions. And unfortunately, I did not win. However, you know, you always take an experience and you make sure that you learn from it. And I learned so many different things about the world of politics, the inside world of politics, even though I was inside government already. But there's a whole different world okay. when it comes to the electoral process. Yes, yes. And the deals that are being made under the table. table right. And I mean, it's very interesting and fascinating experience. And I learned so much more about politics that I didn't know, especially because I spent most of my life in corporate America. Yes. So it's an entirely different world. And... I learned so much and it was just like a pleasure and, and a tremendous learning experience and I just felt as though I had to share what I learned from that experience to the people so they could be more aware of what they do politically and how important their vote really is. Okay. Excellent, excellent. So let's give the audience some some background on you. Um, I mean, your your resume is extensive, so you know you know you could just keep it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. I didn't. You know? Yeah, you I know. Because yeah. we got well, we got a real heavy discussion. Yeah, you know what I mean? that's that because I'm get getting into. old. <laughs> <laughs> I got a long resume because I'm getting old, man. No, brother, man, you've been doing you've been doing a lot of things. You've been out there in the fire. So just yeah. give people um, a quick background of um, some of the things that you've done. Okay, uh, basically. Um, uh, spent most of my life in corporate America, actually 20 plus years, okay. uh, 12 and a half years of it was at, uh, Texaco corporate headquarters up in White Plains where I got involved in this, uh, racial discrimination lawsuit. Okay. Oh, you was a part of that. Yeah. So I was part of that. And so, mm. you know, and, and, and that was very interesting learning experience, uh, talk about fighting wars right against the status quo mm. and Jim Crow and <laughs> right uh, and so from there after I left Texaco after the uh, Chevron takeover uh, I entered into the world of politics and government and I worked in I was appointed to the position of uh, by Mayor Davis as Director of Emergency Services, Natural okay. Disasters, and I specialized in Homeland Security. Mm, okay, bro. Yeah. And from there, I wrote my first, after that, I left from government, I wrote my first book, which was Black to the Future. Right, Black to the Future, I remember Which was that. based on the Texaco racial discrimination lawsuit mm. that we, as a people, had no idea that we actually won that lawsuit. Yes. And, and, but there were so many things that we didn't understand about what really transpired right. inside the walls of Texaco Inc. And then uh, after I left from government, um, I just continued publishing various books and then uh, totally displeased with the educational system, which is like a pet peeve for me because without education, you know, our, our, the future of our youth are, are totally compromised, totally right. compromised. 
and I decided that I was going to run for mayor uh, and take over the school system because I worked in the Board of Education for a minute in the safety aspect and uh, I was appalled at what I saw in the school system, school especially system. in Mount Vernon. And yes. A failing school system is a failing city. This is, this is true. Now, not to go off the topic, but uh, I was um, privileged to some information. I want to know if you're aware of this, too. From what I understand is third, uh, third and fourth grade oh. testing um, coincides with um, them building prisons. They use the testing you know, results and information to determine how many, quote unquote, I guess, urban youth will possibly fail as they become teenagers and become high school that's, students. That's, that's, that's the absolute truth. Okay, um, so it is. I, I learned that, like, when I first came out of uh, corporate, um, I did a little uh, help down in an after-school program mm. back in the community of Mount Vernon. And um, I was surprised um, when Professor Sproul, he used to be a principal at the high school, and I was running for school. I ended up running for school board, all right? Yes. And he shared with me that, oh, they based it. I was telling him that I, I have third grade students that can't do their two times tables without counting on their fingers. And, yes. and me being into math, I was like, my goodness, if they can't do their two times table now, by the time they get to fourth grade, when mm. they start doing division and fractions, right. they're lost. They're lost. And so he told me, he said, oh, that's how they base their uh, prison population, how many prisons they're going to build. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And I just shared one note with you when I was director of emergency services when I'm at yes. these these special uh, conferences yes. and being basically uh, the only one in this field as an African American in these conferences in the state of New York. I'm surprised by that. But, you know, they sit there casually and talk about the bonds that they're passing for prisons. Yes. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there like. This is incredible that this is really going on. They are building prisons based on these test scores, and this is what they're building their economy on. Absolutely. And also, I think um, we see the increase in our, our policing. So I think it's all tied in. Oh, absolutely. Because, I, I mean, you wonder, besides the uh, terrorists, quote-unquote terrorists, attempts and so on and so on there still hasn't been uh, there's been a transition because they always talked about it and they called it the Illuminati this is before everything really got heavy they talked about the new transition right. with the military policing and all these other things so don't think people that it's just because you know of these quote unquote you know you know terrorist attempts this was talked about you know, in the early 90s yeah. about the new change and the new regime of how they were going to do things according to the different, you know, cultural groups, the African-Americans, the Hispanics, and so on and so on. So so um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to go into the book, right? All right, this is your second book. The first book was uh, actually, Black to the Future. This is the second book that I've written. It's the seventh book that I've published. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into your book, which is called Exodus, Why I Became a Republican. <laughs> okay, brother? Yes, sir. So the thing is that I would believe that at this point you are a Democrat, mm. but you made a radical decision um, to become a Republican. So what I'm going to do for, the, for our viewers... I'm just going to read, you know, maybe one or two sentences from the beginning. Um, oh, absolutely. To, all right. So here we go. How could you? What on God's earth could you possibly be thinking? Have you lost your mind? That Negro has really gone crazy. A Republican? <laughs> and I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Brother. So, obviously, you've received some sort, of, uh, uh, some sort of ridicule from your peers and from other people because, like I said, you ran for a, for a mayor and you were a Republican probably for your whole entire life. Is Democrat. This, is it? Democrat. Right, Democrat. Democrat for Democrat. your entire, like... Nearly, almost, not quite, but 40 years. Right, almost 40 years. 40 years, man. 40 years. 
40 years. So, <clears throat> so let's go into, okay, let's go into how this came about. Well, it, it, it has many factors and variables, but um, I realized certain things while I was campaigning. First of all, I was approached okay. by somebody from the Republican Party, and I was adamant that I would never, 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 ever, 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 right. ever be a Republican. I'm going to win the Democrat. I am a Democrat. I am a Democrat till I die. Yes. Okay. But what you find out in politics is that nobody's really truly committed to the Democratic Party. The politicians aren't truly committed to the party because if they don't win the primary, they start making all these side deals. Mm. But I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going that way. Right. Even though I was approached with um about thinking about running on the Republican line. But what I found out was was that the Republican Party had or in Mount Vernon this election had already hooked up with the conservative party mm. that was supporting the controller who was running for the Democratic Party. And I was like, mm. and the and the independent party was supporting Davis just in case he didn't get it. And I was like, man, all these deals going on. Right. But, but the main thing was that I realized nobody had a plan. Right. To deal with the school board, mm -hmm. the school system. The unemployment, right. the young black men in the community, the crime, they had a plan for anything. The infrastructure, no one had a plan. Right. And so I was like, is it me or is this just politics? politics. <laughs> and, and because I was in government and I was in Homeland Security, we had to have a plan because we was dealing with the safety of the city. Yes. So I was like, I thought that I was supposed to have a plan running for office. Yes. And I was like, no, none of the five, four other candidates had a plan. Yes. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. And then I began to wonder, okay, from being inside City Hall, I was wondering if I, if I became mayor as a Democrat, I would have to keep all the, basically, the same staff that's in place because of the party. Mm. And if you saw what I saw <laughs> while I was in government, I would have almost fired everybody. Not, I hope I don't sound like Mitt Romney gonna fire everybody. <laughs> I would have fired like the commissioners and, and and the people that were in 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 charge of certain departments. Yes. That's when you see where politics and favoritism not so much because you qualify for the position, right. but because you helped me with my campaign. And now I got I owe you a favor, even if you're not qualified to do X, Y, Z. Exactly. So and, then so then you get um, people's uh, sons and daughters oh, getting jobs and people that, you know, you may even know. And you'd be like, what? They're making fifty, sixty thousand dollars doing what? And, and, They're not qualified not for that. Quali not quali <laughs> and, 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 and so being from corporate, you know, I, I had a real challenge with that. Now, the other component that I had a challenge with was that we have been, and I mean African Americans in the city of Mount Vernon, yes. have been in charge of this system for the last 30 years. Mm. We have been in total control of the government from the mayor's office, city council, school board. We have run, school board maybe 20, yes. run by United Black Clergy. And, and I, and I kind of like lay all this out in the book as I as I come to this decision, and I had to come to the realization that we have been running this city for like the last thirty years. Yes. And Mount Vernon has been plagued by murder to an unprecedented degree. High crime rate. Yes. Failing school system. I mean, failing school system. Drugs, poverty, and we're in charge of all this. And I'm like, how can this be? be. Yes. Now, being a native of Mount Vernon. I also remember how things were before we was running the city. Yes. And that's so now I'm thinking, how could I, as the mayor, fix this city with these groups of individuals that basically 
I would consider not qualified. I won't say incompetent because everybody's qualified to do something, something in some capacity. Yes. But how could I fix this city with the plans that I had and, and, and what I was thinking about doing? Um, and I said, I didn't see it happening. Yes. I didn't see it happening. Yes. And I noticed that I had some, and, and my campaign manager brought this to my attention. He was like, Pete, when you start talking about your $50 million tax reduction plan and taking over the school system yes. and, 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 and creating employment and jobs uh, for, for the young black youth and, and for anybody in the community to, to, um, through, the, through the revenues that you're going to generate by reducing the tax rate yes. and $50, $50 million windfall, it's like, Pete, you don't sound like a Democrat. And I was like, well, who do I sound like? He said, you sound like more like a Republican or conservative. Right. And I was like, it doesn't matter to me. Right. I'm concerned about fixing the city, city. my city that I was born and raised in, and bring it back. I wrote an article that they published in the Westchester Guardian when I was campaigning called Mount Vernon, a once great city. Mm, Where did, powerful. When did we go from being a... Mount Vernon was... Did you know? And I learned this from the, from the, the seniors. Mount Vernon used to be nationally recognized for its educational system. Ooh, ooh brother. Mm. So nationally did, recognized. Nationally recognized. We were the model. So how did we go from being a nationally recognized city for education mm. to the one of the worst school systems in the county and probably the state of New York? Yes. How did we go from that to that? And we're in charge. Now, these are the realities that I'm now faced with. And it's like, okay, I have to really take a real good look at how we govern. Yes. Now, the other thing was, is that if you look across this, this country nationally in all the urban cities, which basically are under control by a Democratic, Democratic Party. Democratic Party, yes. With mostly black politicians, for the most part in the urban cities, but some white, but mostly Democrats. Yes. You have a broken school system. Drugs, crime, murder, high, high high school dropout rates, and it's just all across the board. Yes. And so are we going to like connect the dots, as Mayor Davis used to tell us in the commissioner's meeting? And I came to a conclusion. Mm. I said, Democrats, a little bit challenged coming to governing, especially for African Americans. And we're being impacted the most, and we support them at least by 90% of us. Yes. And I was like, so the people who we are electing to office as Democrats may not have our best interests exactly. at heart. Because exactly. if you look nationally as what's happening to us, we are languishing tremendously in this society. Right. And so I became deeply concerned. And then I also came to the realization that some of my economic philosophies, I was an economics major in college. Yes. Management and economics. And so, and mine is sociology, psychology. So I'm putting okay, all, I'm connecting yeah. all these dots. And yeah. I'm like saying, okay, so if my message is starting to sound like Republican, I'm like, it doesn't matter to me who it's sounding like, right. but if a $50 million tax reduction plan can, can, can change the dynamics yes. and change the educational system and how we do education and fix the infrastructure and, and, and provide training and opportunity, because <clears throat> see, it's economic, it's socioeconomic, but it's economics. Yes. I said, then, then, let it be what it is. Yes. <laughs> However, the Republicans are committed to reducing property taxes, but they're not exactly concerned about what happens to the children in the school, school system. system. They're just concerned. And so I'm like saying, you know what? They may be interested in the, my $50 million tax reduction plan, but see, their morality as far as applying it, they don't care how they apply it as long as their property taxes are reduced. And so yes. that's that's probably our difference on where we would do it. But I'm like saying our commitment to reducing it is there. Now, as the mayor, 
if I submit this and they support it and then we implement it, I say, man, we have something here. Yes. We can change the dynamics of Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. So now I'm getting excited. We can put, I don't care what your past was. Right. You know what? I have I have I have some money that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna fix all the broken sidewalks and all the streets in Mount Vernon. Yes. And if you want to work, you can work. Yes. This is great. And this is what this is what a city of like uh, Mount Vernon would would need. Yeah. Um, is is definitely in need of because as you mentioned and I see a lot of the construction and oh goodness like things that were going on as far as the buildings that were being built. Uh, I really didn't see a lot of. African Americans working on those construction. Can I correct sites. you for a minute? Okay, brother. I know what I'm gonna correct say. you. And you I know what I'm gonna say. say. I said I didn't see too many. Let's see. Let's see what the, what the real deal is. Did you see any? any. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, did you see any? <laughs> mm. So I have a chapter in my book called "The Black Church" because see, there's we're talking about this building that they built in Mount Vernon by Grace Baptist Church multi-million dollar project yes now my my th my thing is is if the black church is constructing a multi-million dollar project and they won't even prepare the young black men the disenfranchised black men of the community yes now if we won't hire them if the church won't hire them on a multi-million dollar how can you expect anybody else, else. to hire them if the church won't set up a training program for them to be prepared to go into these construction mm. projects, how do you expect somebody else to hire them? That's right. If the church won't do it. Yeah, it's a lot of things to really look at and, 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 and ask the questions, why? Why? And why? so I'm like, that's criminal in essence in the community. And I'm like, that's unacceptable. However, the church expect for you to come into the doors of the church and pay your tithes and your offering. And, 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 and what black man, what young black man, and see the relevance of the black church is so important to, to, and it makes such a difference in how we as a people have always functioned and it has been yes, the institution definitely. for us. Yes. And I'm saying, even our institution has been compromised by the politicians. Mm -hmm. And because the church basically dictates how we vote. Yes. And who we vote for. And so all the politicians, all the Democratic politicians, they come in when it's time to get elected. Yes. You know, and I realized something else. Malcolm X was having the same dialogue 50, 50 <laughs> years ago. 50 years ago, brother. 50 years ago, Malcolm X was saying the same thing. You know, they come into our neighborhoods when it's time for us to vote for them. And then after that, and our preachers come in and tell us this is who you need to vote for, and we vote for them, and that's that. And after they, they get elected, we don't see them anymore. They don't do anything in our community. And I'm like, you know what? Right. Almost like they just write, just write, write us off. This is totally unacceptable. We can we, we cannot keep doing politics like this. Mm -hmm. We have to change how we do politics. And so I'm submitting to the people that we look at other alternatives. Yes. And, 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 I, and I even, like, I'll stay on with Malcolm X for a minute. He had, Mon back, he, he did this speech. It's called The Ballad on the Bullet. Yes. And, and, and he admonished the, the Democrats, or uh, not the Democrats, the African Americans, uh, back when Kennedy was elected for president. Yes. And he said to them, he said, you have giving all your votes to the Democrats. They have 60%, 67% of the House, majority. Mm. Uh, six, 67 out of 100 seats in the Senate. Yes. Okay, now that's a strong majority. Definitely. They have passed every legislation that they wanted to pass, but they have yet to deal with any legislation pertaining to African Americans, well, they were they were Negroes or blacks back then, but whatever it doesn't matter. But as far as our legis legislation concerning our matters, they had not even come close to even dealing with. Yes. 
Absolutely. And, and we are under the impression that the Democrats are for us, all right? And what a lot of us don't even realize is that we were Republicans before we were Democrats mm. after the Emancipation Proclamation. Nation. But we won't get into the validity or, 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 <laughs> or, or, the, or the, you know, how legitimate the, the Emancipation Proclamation was. Yes. However, because of that, we were Republicans. Yeah. And the transition came because of economics with FDR and the New Deal. Now keep in mind this, however, we went from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party because of economics, because of jobs and opportunity that was pres presented in the New Deal. Yes. Perfectly logical reason to make a transition like that. It didn't have anything to do with the civil rights because that, during that time, this country was as racist as ever. The Democrats in the South were as racist as ever. Yes. If you listen to the rise and fall of Jim Crow, I'm, I'm not sure of, of the woman who wrote that book or the, or the, or, or the DVD that um, they have on it, but she, she references uh, some incidences with, with what transpired with white women towards to the white men to save them from the Negroes, from the coloreds, from the Negroes, yes, we'll call it. excellent. And there wasn't much love for the, for the African-American blacks in, in the Democratic Party during that time. And what we keep forgetting is, is that King, if it wasn't for King breaking down those barriers, we would probably be leaning more towards the Republicans. Right, excellent. So what I'm gonna do, brother, is um, I'm gonna allow you to let people know um, where they can purchase your books, because um, they can Google you, right? They can Google you. I uh, mean, you're, you're for the other book that you publish, that is for sale at this particular moment. Yes. This book will be for sale by the uh, end of the week. By by the end of the week. So um, is there any information you want to leave our viewers with so that way they can follow your journey and support your your books? Well, well, we're building a new website right now. Okay, it's www.whyibecamearepublican.com. The letter Y, I became a Republican .com. Oh, this is, okay, brother. This um, is great. But you can still reach me at PeteSherelle at Hotmail.com. Okay. Um, I, su I suggest that you read this information. It's, it's, it contains a, a lot of pertinent and valuable information just to bring to a level of consciousness because that's what it is. It's a call to consciousness. And it's also just an education on the political science that transpired. And I'm just saying that we really need to rethink and, and deal with how precious and how valid our vote is and to let people stop taking our vote for granted. Excellent, brother, excellent. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, I'm gonna actually have you on the show um, in the near future again because there is so much information and dialogue that um, we will continue to have in the midst of uh, getting this book out so I definitely want to let our viewers and the public know about the progress and also the continuation of why you became a Republican. Absolutely. Because the reality is that, I mean, I understand what you're doing because there's nothing wrong with change, okay? Um, you know, you're doing something for 30, 40 years and you see that it's not working. Um, Absolutely. You need to change. So for good or for bad, it's, it's about making a conscious decision about change and then how you can affect this new party that doesn't really represent the people like they normally do. Maybe you can go in and shake some things up and change some things. So it's not as all bad as people make it seem. So once again, I'd like to thank you for coming I on the show. I thank you, sir. All right. I thank you very much. All right. Really. All right. And I'd like to thank our viewers. Stay tuned for our next show, Media Monsters TV. Peace. This is Rhythm, the media monster.